Good evening, good evening, good evening to each and every one of you. I pray that you have had a blessed day on today. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And I pray that you have been rejoicing and being glad all day today that God has allowed us to see another brand new day. And now it is dawning toward the evening, and we are just thanking God that we are still alive because Somebody got up this morning, but they are not going to be able to lay down tonight because their voices have been hushed up on this side. And we just count it a privilege and an honor that God uh, allowed us. It's not because of anything that we have done, because we all know that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we thank God again for another glorious day day to be able to come to say that we thank him we give him praise we give him honor and we give him glory but before we get started just a, a couple of announcements um let us keep the clark family in prayer on the loss of brother anthony clark uh the funeral arrangements at this time are incomplete so as we no more. Maybe by Sunday we may know more, so we'll be able to get that announcement out to you. And then I'm sure that many of you have seen on Facebook and it also has been on the news. Let us keep the Davis family in prayer. Our uh, little Miss Arielle Davis uh, has been missing uh, since yesterday uh, sometime, so we're just going to continue to pray because we know that God's eyes are everywhere. And there's nothing that goes on that he is not aware of. So we are praying for a safe return. Uh, and we just ask God to be with uh, Minister uh, Terrence and Lady um, Cameron uh, Davis and their entire family. And we just rally around them, uh, keeping them lifted up in prayer. Amen. For our scripture tonight, we're going to read uh, the scripture that we are going to be looking at tonight. Our scripture is going to be taken from 2 um, Corinthians, uh, the mm, Second Corinthians, the seventh chapter, verses eight through ten, and it reads, "For though I made you sorry with the letter." I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were not it were but for a season. Now I rejoice that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing that, I keep losing my place, sorry. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, Yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this manner. May God bless the reading of his holy and divine word. Let us pray. Father God, we just come right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for another day, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to be able to reason, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord God, that when we got up this morning, Lord God, we were able to dress ourselves, Lord God. We didn't have to wait for anybody to come and uh, put our clothes on it or either to come and give us a shower or a bath and then dress us, Lord. We were able to do these things on our own, Lord God, with no help from anyone except for you and you alone. And we say thank you. 
because we realize that it could have been the other way. Lord, we just thank you this morning, uh, this evening, Lord God, that not only that, Lord God, that we uh, have a vine, Lord God, to, because somebody woke up this morning, they tried to put their shoes on their head, Lord God. And uh, Father, we just thank you right now, Lord God, that we knew who we were, where we were, and who we are, Lord God. And we just thank you for that right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come lifting up our pastor, Lord God, and asking you, Lord God, to continue to bless him, Lord God. Uh, continue, Lord God, to uh, to heal his body. Not only him, Lord God, but those others that we know of and some that we do not know, Lord God. The sick and shut in all over this uh, city, Lord God, all over this state, all over this land. We lift them up to you right now in the name of Jesus because we know that you are aware of of everything that is going on. And Father, Lord God, there is no sickness, Lord God, that you cannot heal or you cannot cure of. Father, we just thank you right now, Lord God, for your shedding of your blood, Lord God, because the, it, it, we know that you shed your blood, Lord God, so that we might have a right to the tree of life. Then, Lord God, not only did you shed your blood for our uh of salvation, but Lord God, you shed your blood, Lord God, you, because you said you were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon you, Lord God, and by your stripes, you said that we are healed. So Father God, we just thank you for walking and healing right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we pray for uh, uh, the bereaved families all over this land and country, Lord God, we lift up uh, the Clark family right now in the name of Jesus and others, Lord God, that may be looking uh, on this evening, uh, those that may look at it later. But Father, we extend our sympathy toward them, Lord God, but we know that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal. But Father God, we just lift them up to you right now and ask, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit will minister to them as only you can. Father, we know that as we live uh, before you, if you don't come back, Lord God, and, and soon, Lord God, we know that uh, we all, Lord God, will have to go, uh, we will all die, Lord God. But Father, we realize, Lord God, that death is inevitable. But Father, one thing that we do know, Lord God, that we may die on this side, Lord God, but we will be resurrected on the other side. So, Father, we just thank you right now that those, Lord God, that have not made preparations for a life beyond this, let them know that this is not all there is to life. There is a life after this one, Father, and we thank you for that. Now, Lord God, we lift up the Davis family before you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We pray right now, Lord God, that you would uh, look at, Father, we know that we've, you, we've got the sheriff out everywhere and they're looking. But Father God, I know, Lord God, that you can lead them to wherever she is. Because, Father, it is no mystery to you. You know where she is, Lord God. And Father, we just plead the blood of Jesus all over her from the top of her head to the very sole of her feet, Lord God. We just thanking you right now, Lord God, for a favorable outcome in this situation. Lord, we just love you right now. We bless you and we praise you, Lord God. We give you glory. We give you honor and we invoke your presence on this line tonight. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. In Jesus' name, we do pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. And amen. As I said, we thank God for another opportunity to be able to come into your homes this evening. We're not going to prolong the time. We're going to get right on into the study of God's word. When a uh, pastor asked me um, what, uh, I mean, if I would um, do the Bible study uh, tonight and immediately I began to think, well, you know, what are we going to, what subject would be? Be, um, good for us to talk about this evening and right almost immediately the Holy Spirit uh, spoke to me and said that we were going to talk about re true repentance because I think sometimes we got it tr uh, twisted uh, uh, because uh, true repentance is a, a very prominent theme 
in the preaching of the gospel. Because true repentance is a call in, to repent. And so Jesus uh, wanted it to be preached in his name to all nations. And we see that uh, if we go over in Luke uh, 24, uh, verses 46 and 47. Let me see if I can get there. Okay, Luke 46 and 47. And this is what it uh, says. Uh, it's Luke 24, 46, and 47. And he, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. So Jesus wanted it to be wanted repentance to be preached. Peter even proclaimed a uh, 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 repentance and called uh, people in his sermons to repent. Not only did uh, Peter talk about repentance in Acts, but Paul also talked about a uh, repentance. He even spoke of repentance. Uh, to those uh, apostles, I mean, not apostles, but he even spoke of uh, repentance to the philosophers uh, that was there. In Acts uh, 17, uh, verses 30 and 31, look what Paul said. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to do what? To repent. Why? Because he had appointed a day in the which... He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So repentance is a, a, a very important part of our, uh, of our believer's life. Uh, and so, uh, however... We're living in days and times now when um, it seems like the call to repentance is being neglected uh, in, in preaching. Because, you know, uh, in, if you listen sometimes, you know, it, there's a good word coming from, uh, uh, you know, from the, uh, the, the pulpit. But it's only some who preach faith only. By some, they are only preaching and stressing baptism. But we've got to uh, hear more about preaching about repentance. Uh, because you can't really uh, truly preach the gospel of Christ without a call to repent. And so that leads us to look at three things this evening. What is repentance? How is it produced? And what are the, some of the indications that repentance has occurred? I uh, know, and so there is, this is the reason why I thought that today's verse, uh, Ephesians, not Ephesians, I'm sorry, um, that first, uh, the second Corinthians 7, 9 through 11 was such an elaborate uh, scripture on repentance because it serves as a text uh, for our lesson today when we are talking about true repentance. And so, first of all, though, what we want to do is that we want to define true repentance because there are some misconceptions of repentance. And I know that and, uh, we're going to look at what some of those uh, misconceptions about repentance are. First of all, we see, um, you know, repentance uh, has been um, known to be just uh, that it is being sorry. And we see in, in, in our scripture today, in, in our lesson text, that it shows that repentance is an outcome of sorrow. It is not just being sorry. Uh, see, sorry leads is what leads to repentance. But sorry, just being sorry itself is not repentance. 
And so we've been taught so much that, you know, you just, you know, got to be soft. Yes, I'm sorry. And we're going to get on into that just in a, in a little bit more. And so just sorrow itself, uh, 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 sorrow, sorrow leads to repentance. But sorrow itself is not repentance. Because, and then so many times we've heard that repentance uh, is a changed life. But some um, have misunderstood that repentance is a converted life. No, not not just uh, repentance alone is not, a, uh, you know, not being changed. And, and in Acts 3 and 19, it reveals that repentance and conversion are two separate things. Therefore, uh, when Peter said, uh, he said, uh, when he told him to, he, he said, uh, repent and then be converted. See, those are two separate things. Peter said, he said, repent and be ye converted. And so if it was the same thing, he would not have, uh, you know, he wouldn't have said it as with repent and be converted. So if repentance is the same as conversion, then Peter was being redundant. But as we can see, the order is actually this. First, sorrow then repentance, and finally, a changed life. That is the order in which it goes. Uh, so we, that's what we're going to, but uh, that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. Some understand that uh, repentance is a converted life. Uh, but like, as I said before, but Paul uh, said that it was, I mean, not Paul, but Peter he said that be he said to uh, be ye converted. Now, re, re, I mean, repent therefore and be converted. You could not be converted without first repenting, and so it's not the same. What he was saying is that first you got to become sorry, and we know that it's not just sorry. We're gonna see uh, on, on on into this lesson. We're gonna see where you got to be godly sorrow. Because there is a difference in just being sorry and then being godly sorrow. And so after sorrow come repentance. And then after repentance, you, there comes a what? A changed life. Uh, and so many times, you know, we, we want to try to put the horse before the cart. But what we've got to do, we've got to realize that, that I mean, that is not the way that it should work. Yes, we're going to be sorry. But not not so uh, sorry that uh, nothing changes. And so that's what we are going to be looking at. See, a proper definition of repentance we can be, be found in W.E. Vine's definition when he said a change of mind. It involves both uh, turning from sin and turning to God. Uh, because any time that you repent, it, it revolves a turning. You can't repent and still remain the same because you're going to turn away from one thing and turn to another. And so if you're turning away from sin, then you should be turning away to um, turning away from sin and turning what to God. So you just simply think of repentance as being what a change of mind in which we decide to turn from sin and turn to God. That's why it is preceded by sorrow. Because there comes a point in time in our lives when we just get tired. Uh, you know, it's like, I can't go on living this way. You know, I, I just got to have a, a, you know, a, a change of mind. And then when your mind change, it's, uh, you got to have a change of heart to go along with it. Because just having a, a changed mind, see that mind can change back anytime that it wants to. And I think that's the problem so many times today is that, yes, we have a changed mind, but then we go back and we fall back into that same mindset. It's because our hearts were never changed. It was not godly sorrow that actually happened. We were just sorry. And then see, when, uh, when we have that change of uh, uh, a man, and when we turn from sin and we turn to God, and it's that's why it is changed. It is, I mean, it is followed by a changed life. So therefore, we uh, repentance is a decision of the man. 
in which one decides to change their lives. But then you uh, wonder, well, what made them change, uh, uh, make that decision? Well, let's look at our second outline because uh, we, we talked about what a uh, uh, proper definition of repentance, that is uh, turning from sin and turning to God. Uh, you can't have a changed mind without having a changed heart. So producing what produces true repentance? It is godly sorrow that produces repentance. Because if it's not godly sorrow, then it's not going to work. It has to be godly sorrow. See, we uh, we saw that in our lesson, that in our verses that we read uh, uh, today. In uh, 2 Corinthians, the ninth, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 7 chapter in verses 9 and 10. Uh, we, uh, but we got to note carefully that it is not just simply sorrow. But it's, it has to be what? Godly sorrow. But there is a difference, as I said before, there is a difference in the sorrow of the world and then godly sorrow. Now, I want you to notice the difference between the godly sorrow and the worldly sorrow. See, worldly sorrow is a, a selfish kind of sorrow. It's when uh, we sorry because what? We got caught. That's the only, only reason why we're sorry because what? I got caught. If I hadn't got caught, then I, would, I wouldn't have a, a, a problem with it. I would keep on doing what I'm doing. But I'm sorry because I got caught. And another uh, 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 thing about the worldly sorrow is that uh, when, we, um, when one is sorry because of uh, what you did made you look bad. And a lot of times, we, not only are we sorry that we got caught, but I'm sorry because of what I did, it made me look bad. Now, isn't that being selfish? So that has nothing to do with God. It's all about me, about how I, how, how I want other people to perceive me uh, as always doing that, uh, what is right. When I know that I'm not living a godly life and I don't, you know, it's not, I have not changed uh through godly sorrow, I'm just sorry because you caught me. You saw me. I got caught. That's why I'm sorrowful. And then again, it was because what I did make me look bad among my peers. Or make me good, look bad among those who I am trying to impress. And so worldly sorrow is more concerned about self. Whereas godly sorrow is more concerned about God. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's a, so with godly sorrow, it's according to what God wants and what how God wants us to walk, how God wants us to perceive him, how he wants us to uh, carry his word in, into the world, how he wants us to, uh, to be a light that draws others to him. Uh, and, and the only way that we can do that, we've got to be godly sorrowful. And so, and, as, uh, and another reason one is sorry is because their sins uh, or their actions are sins. Uh, I mean, that, this is godly sorrow. When we are sorry because of what we did, our, uh, uh, you know, our sins, uh, it, it, um, it grieved God. You know, and so we ought to be able now to, uh, to a point whereas when we do something and we know that I shouldn't have said that. You ever said something and the minute that it came, you know, and it doesn't have to be what we call a curse word. But it uh, it's just something that, you know, you say it and at the time it sh should not have been said. Uh, it was no cause for us to say it. And right then and there you were convicted. That's called godly sorrow. Because what well, I know that I was not a light uh, for the master. I know that I could not draw anyone uh, with, uh, with that type of per, uh, perception. And so that's what we call godly sorrow. When we say something or we do something 
that does not cause a, a God to get the glory. But if we are only looking for glory for ourselves and gratification for ourselves, that's um that I mean that's not godly sorrow. That is sorrow uh for the word uh, that's worldly sorrow. Because worldly sorrow, as I said, that it can turn it can uh turn back. Uh and uh, one is when we're sorry uh, you know, and godly sorrow too is when we are sorry for the price that God paid uh, in order to have our sins removed. When you think about it, we just uh, celebrated Resurrection Sunday, and we know uh, that in order for him to be resurrected, he first had to what? He had to die. And when we think about all that he went through, how he... Uh, was uh, nailed in his hands, his feet pierced in the side, crown of thorn uh, shoved down on his head, and how the blood came streaming down. He didn't do that for himself because the Bible says that he who knew no sin, he became what? He became sin for us. And when we can become godly sorrow, of all the that he had to go through in order to pay the price for our sins. See, uh, in other words, godly sorrow is, is more than being concerned about ourselves. Godly sorrow is what? Is when we don't want, it's almost like uh, we you know when we were children, we always uh, wanted to do those things that would make our parents proud. And uh, and that's the way it is now. We, uh, or that's the way it should be. Uh, with you know, with godly sorrow, I'm so, you know, it makes me sorry for when you know what I don't do things uh, uh, to that pleases my master. And that's the way we ought to be. Godly sorrow for what I was not a good representation of you today, Father. I realize that I, I, I you know, I should not have said that. Uh, I should have said what you led me to uh, to say. And so I repent. That's godly sorrow because we did not uh, display God in the conversation. And so also when one is sorry, uh, as I said before, the sins that he had to pay for, uh, I mean, for the, uh, I mean, he had to pay for the price that he had to pay for our sins. He didn't have to uh, pay it for himself because he didn't see that sin. But he paid that price so that we would, so that we could live eternally in glory with him. And so uh, worldly sorrow is when we are more concerned about ourselves. But there is some differences. See, worldly sorrow produces reg regret, but godly sorrow suffers loss in nothing. See, if you got that worldly sorrow, like I said, you, you know, you're going to suffer regret. Just like, it's, uh, you know, I've said that, you know, sometimes we're sorry because we got caught. So there's a regret, regret in us getting caught. I never intended for them to see me doing this, but I got caught. So that's the way it is with the worldly sorrow. It carries regret with it. But godly sorrow, a uh, godly sorrow suffers loss in nothing. You will never lose anything when you walking in godly sorrow. See, worldly sorrow produces death, but godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. See, if godly sorrow leads to repentance, how best to produce the godly sorrow in others? Well, we're going to talk about that. Producing godly sorrow that leads to to repentance. Remember how Nathan uh, over in uh, 2 Samuel 12 chapter, we won't go there, but if you want to make a note, 2 Samuel 12 chapter verses 7 through 12, when Nathan rebuked David, remember when he uh, went to, uh, when Nathan went to David and had this parable and he was telling him about, uh, you know, the family that had this little pet lamb and, uh, and the, um, <clears throat> and the uh, neighbor had uh, all that they wanted, you know, like rich, and they had plenty of uh, lambs, and but the uh, uh, those 
you know, poor little family, they only had that wee little family lamb that they were so, they loved so much. But it was, you know, he told them that when um, the rich family got, um, kind of paraphrasing it, when they had someone to come off for dinner, what they did, instead of going out there and killing one of theirs, their lambs, what they did was went and took the pet lamb. They stole that little pet lamb from that family and they killed it. And when Nathan asked David, what you think ought to be done about that? And David said, you ought to have him killed. And that's when Nathan told him, thou art the man. In other words, he was talking about him because David could have his pick of any woman that was in the kingdom. But now you wanted Uriah's wife. You're going to set him up, send him out to battle. And then uh, you slept with his wife and she became pregnant. That's why you sent him uh, out to battle. And when he wanted to come back in uh, and then uh, you tried to fix it up so that he wouldn't, you know, so he would go and sleep with his wife. So you could say that that baby was, you know, when she found out she was pregnant and told him that then David trying to make sure that uh, Uriah sleep with her so he could say that that was Uriah's child. But one thing about God. God, when we mess up, we might as well confess up because God is not playing. Uh, because um, uh, the worldly sorrow, as I said, it produces death. But godly sorrow re re uh, produces repentance to salvation. And so when, uh, and, and that's when David knew, that's when he wrote that 51st number of Psalm, when he knew that he was wrong, when Nathan told him because he made uh, uh, an appeal to God's love. And then he re and he revealed the sin to David. It, he, he did not re uh, uh, make an appeal to God's love without warning him of the consequences. And see, the gospel of Christ, when, it, when, we, when, we, when it's properly taught, it's designed to produce what? Godly sorrow. And after that godly sorrow should come what? Repentance. See, it appeals to God's love as a basis for repentance. Uh, a, a godly sorrow, you know, God's love. For God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave his only begotten son. And then Christ loved us so much that he was what? Willing to go to the cross. Remember, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it said that uh, as he was there, he was beginning to, uh, the sweat was coming off of him like drops of blood. And then that was when he he said, uh, uh, Father, if it's thou will take this cup from me. But then he came back and he stepped back over into that, uh, 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 that, that spirit that God had given him. He said, but nevertheless, thou will. Let thy will be done. In other words, I came to do your will, and it's your will that I'm going to do. And because what? He was in the flesh, and he was what? He was uh, being bruised. He, he, he already knew what he was going to have to go through. And so it was like, I don't want to have to go through this. But nevertheless, Father, if it's your will, then I will go through it. See, the gospel, uh, when we talk about the gospel, uh, as I said, you know, when it's properly taught and we teach people about godly sorrow and um, it will cause them to what? To turn and repent. And so it, it because in the, in the reason why they will turn and repent is because godly sorrow will what lead to repentance because what will it will do? It will reveal our sin according to Romans 3 and 23. Romans 3 and 23. It will reveal our it will reveal our sin. So um let's see if I can turn to that right quick. X uh Romans. I thought I had um gotten these pages together, but I see that I did not do it. Okay, Romans 3 and 23. We already know what that is, but I want to make sure I read it right. 
For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it didn't say y'all, it said for all of us have sinned and we come short of his what? Of his glory. And the only way that we could get back to God is that what? Christ had to come and uh, and he had to pay the ultimate price of dying on that old cross in order to buy our redemption back. And that was through the blood that Christ shed on Calvary. And also, uh, if we go over in uh, Romans, we won't go back there and read it, but it's in the second chapter, Romans 2, 5 through 11. Our best hope for producing uh, repentance in others that leads to salvation is to proclaim the gospel in its entirety. In other words, don't just give them part of it. We've got to give them the whole message, not just the command to believe, repent, and be baptized, nor, uh, uh, and nor just the promises of remission of sins and eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But we also got to tell them the facts about a man's sins. God's love and the coming judgment. See, we can't leave all of that out. That's too important. And I believe uh, nowadays, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, we just don't talk about sin enough. And 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 people think that it's okay. I can continue to do what I'm doing, and I'm still going to heaven anyhow. But you know, it's going to be a rude awakening when we be uh, when 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 we. Hey, look, when we get up on the other side and it's not going to be the side where we thought we were going, but we're going to be, it's going to be a rude awakening. So therefore we can't cut the corners and tell them all about the good stuff. When you just believe and uh, uh, confess and with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and uh, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be, thou shalt be saved. He said, thou art saved, thou shalt be saved, because there are some more things that you got to do. And you and it's not just all the, uh, the tell them about all the promises of eternal life, about the gift of the Holy Spirit, but the main fact of the matter is that we are sinful creatures. And if we don't make a habit of staying in the word, then what? We will fall back into those same old habits that we have been in. Uh, uh, be, and, and so, as he said, the, 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 you know, the wages of sin is what? It's death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Because if we continue in sin, you know, but that's a God, Paul said, God forbid. So how can we say that we have been changed creatures? Because we just saw that godly sorrow, it brings about a, what, a change. See, worldly sorrow, you can stay the same. But with godly sorrow, you can't stay the same. It brings about a change. And so, that's why people are, so many people are not responding to the commands of the gospel. Because we need to consider whether we are providing proper emphasis to the facts of the gospel. And remember, I told you the facts is talking about the sins, talking about God's love, and then the coming judgment. They need to know about that. Not just about, you know, okay, you just believe it and be baptized. But, and not just telling them, you know, all about the promises of eternal life. You know, but they think, oh, you know, I've got eternal life. But no, there are some things that we're going to have to do. There are some things that we have to drop off. Uh, and so that is the reason why I, you know, I just, like I said, I just don't think we talk about repentance enough in our local churches. And, uh, you know, to, we got to let people know that, you know, when, when this life we say we've been changed, we've been changed. See, when we've been truly changed, that means that I've got a whole mad different mindset. The things that I used to do, I don't do them no more. You don't have that desire to do them. When I'm not saying I, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about us as uh, as believers. You know, so when we've been truly, truly changed, our desires change. 
as pastor says all the time, my appetite changed. You know, so the things that was interesting uh, to me that was in the world that I was doing, that was going against everything uh, that was godly, I should not have a taste for that anymore. I should have dropped that uh, because that, that is true repentance. Because true repentance, it will lead to what? It will lead to godly sorrow. And it will cause you to have a change of mind and just to have a change of mind without uh, turning from sin and turning to God. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, it will not profit us anything. If we just, okay, I have a change of mind. Uh-oh, I just changed my mind. I changed right back. So if without, if you have a change of mind without it having, causing you to have a change of heart, see, if our heart does not change, we're going to still find ourselves falling all, you know, falling back into the same rut. Why do you think, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, people can come out of things that they've been doing and then when you see them again, they've all, they've fallen back into it. Why? It's because what? They never had a change of heart. They had a change of mind. But see, if the change of mind does not lead you to have a change of heart, then you will go back. And so uh, what, what we can see then that uh, this can be, uh, be defined as earnestness and having a zeal, uh, 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 you, know, w- you know, with what you, uh, uh, when you are in the word of God, you got a zeal for it. You got a passion for doing uh, the will of God. You, and, and you got to be quick to want to do what is right. And see, uh, because we, what, we want to clear ourselves because sometimes uh, we we just want to make sure that we clear ourselves of the blame. It doesn't matter where, what I did, whether it was right or wrong. I just don't want to be blamed for it. But that's, again, talking about self. That's a worldly uh, uh, type of sorrow because I don't want to be blamed. Never once thinking about what it would do to God's heart. And, it's, and you know, it's quick to stop doing what's wrong uh, if you don't want no, you don't want to be uh, caught and be blamed for it, and to, uh, so in the same way is that we can respond to the offer of forgiveness when uh, when you know when we realize that what we are doing is wrong, or that we are guilty of it, and so instead of just trying to clear ourselves, we've got to have a clear conscience. Whereas what we've been washed of it. And so uh, it, it, this involves a sort of like anger or moral outrage toward the sin when we repent of it. You know, some of the things, can you believe sometimes, you know, when you think about some of the things that we did uh, before we got saved and you're just like, I can't believe I even did that. I can't believe that I even went there. Whatever did I see in that place or whatever did I see in doing that, uh, you know, we, but that causes godless sorrow now that, you know, we have come out of it. Uh, but, you know, and then sometimes uh, we have fear uh, because we don't want to repeat it. But when God, when we've had a change of heart, uh, we should not go back and and, and, and repeat, uh, you know, these sins. Because what? We've got godless sorrow that I don't want to go back there. Because you know what? You don't want to go back and then don't be able to come back out. You may, hey, look, we may die in that thing. So we don't want that to be, uh, we don't want to get caught there with it. And so what we got to do is continue to be godly sorrow. And sometimes, uh, you know, people, re- uh, I know some people uh, misunderstand the term repentance to mean a uh, turning from sin, but uh, regretting sin and turning from it, they are related to repentance, but they are not the precise meaning of the word. Uh, because in the Bible, the word repent means to change one's mind. And so the Bible also tells us that true repentance will result in a change of actions. And summarizing his ministry, see, Paul declares, he said, 
I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. You'll find that in Acts 26 and 20. But the short biblical definition of repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. If we're still doing the same thing that we've been doing, then it's perhaps we need to check ourselves. What then is the connection between repentance and salvation? See, the, in the book of Acts, it, is, it, it especially focused on repentance in regards to salvation. To repent concerning salvation is to change your mind regarding sin and Jesus Christ. See, in, in Peter's uh, sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost, he concluded with a call for the people to repent. Repent from what? Peter calls the people to repent uh, from those who had rejected Jesus Christ. And uh, all of us at one time, we rejected Jesus because what? We were born sinners because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden. We were sinners. So we were not born saved. Uh, we were born sinners. And so Peter called the people to change their minds in order to offer the past rejection of Christ and to embrace our faith in him as their Messiah and their Savior. And that's what we have to do. We have to, uh, our repentance ought to involve recognizing that we have thought wrong in the past and determine that we are going to think right in the future. See, the repentant person has second thoughts about the mindset that he formerly embraced. See, there's a not only a change of mind, but there's a change of disposition and a new way of thinking about God about a new way we think about sin, about holiness, and about doing God's will. We're no longer trying to do the will of the enemy, but we're trying to do God's will. And we know uh, 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 we're not going to ever be what, free of sin, but we ought to be, as pastors say, we ought to be dropping off what daily. We ought to be dropping off something each and every day. I'm, I'm better today than I was yesterday. And tomorrow, I am going to be better than I am today. See, true repentance is prompted, as I can't say this enough, by godly sorrow, and it leads to salvation. See, repentance and faith can be understood as two sides of the same coin. But it's impossible to place your faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior without first changing your mind about your sin and about who Jesus is and what he has done. Whether it is repentance from willful rejection or repentance from ignorance or just being disinterested, it is a change of mind. We must have a change of mind. See, repentance is not a work that we do in order to earn salvation. Because no one can repent and come to God unless God pulls that person. He said nobody can come to him unless what? Unless the Father draws him unto himself. You see that in John 6 and 44. See, repentance is something that God gives. And it is only possible because of his grace. Nobody can repent unless God grants repentance. See, all of salvation, including repentance and faith, it is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. See, God's long-suffering leads us to what? To repentance, just as does his kindness. So while repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to tru truly change our minds without changing our actions in some way. And because in the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called, pe uh, called the people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Because a person who has truly repented of sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life. Haven't you ever seen uh, people, you know, they may have been, uh, you know, you, when you last saw them, they were a drug addict. And then when you saw them, it had been, been uh, years since you've seen them. Now you see them 
and they are sold out for Christ. So, in other words, uh, we can't, uh, when we start talking about this sorry, and I, I don't think I can reiterate that enough, just saying sorry and being sorry or even feeling sorry is not the same as repenting. And sometimes we just say, say sorry because that's what we've been taught to say, sorry. See, a person, of, see, uh, you, we can feel emotionally sorry uh, for something without addressing the underlying issue. When we know the underlying issue, the reason why we did what we did was because of what? Sin. But if we never uh, address it, we just feel emotional. Oh, I'm sorry, as I said before, because we got caught. That's why we're sorry. But if we never uh, uh, never address the underlying issue, then we will continue. See, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. And it leaves no regret. But as I said before, worldly sorrow brings what? Death. See, Judas felt great remorse over what he had done to Jesus. Uh, but, he, he, but he did not repent. Remember when they came and gave him the money, he threw the money uh, down. He didn't want it. But instead, what did he do? He ended up committing suicide. And just like uh, Apostle Peter, remember Peter also felt great remorse over his denial of Christ. But in, in his case, it did result in a genuine repentance and a change of direction. As later, Peter, remember how boldly Peter proclaimed Christ in the face of persecution? So we saw there are two different uh, scenarios of, 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 of a change. Uh, see, Judas never had a godly change, but Peter did. And see, when a person is doing something that he has chosen to do and may even enjoy doing a great deal of it, but then it based on uh, his exposure to the word of God, he repents. It means that he has changed his mind about it. In other words, the repentant person comes to believe what he or she once loved is wrong and that they should stop doing it. And so that's when we call, you know, as I, the scenario I was given about somebody being strung out on drugs and the next time you see them, you know, you see them now they're a changed person because they what they took it uh, serious because not only that they are. Uh, uh, have uh, they were sorry for what they were doing and how they had uh, turned their back on Jesus and never accepted him, but they had godly sorrow. So much so that they had a change of heart. So we will uh, continue uh, talking about this on next week. If Pastor doesn't have anything else that he wants to come in and talk about, but um, we will continue talking about this uh, uh, in a, um, you know, next week, talking about this godly sorrow because I, it's, uh, uh, because as I stated before, I don't think we talk about sin enough and we don't talk about repentance. You know, we just think that we are okay the way that we are and we could continue to go in the way that we're going when a lot of times, and like I said, the reason why we're sorry is that world is sorry. We're just sorry that we got caught. I'm sorry because it may uh, people see me now for who I am because I, I, <clears throat> I got caught or now they know that I'm not living that life that uh, I proclaim that I am living. So again, I pray that um, this word has been a blessing to you tonight. You Galileans, I uh, look to see you on uh, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock sharp. And for those of you, I pray that wherever you your attendance is, that you will be making your way into the house of the Lord because God has been good to us and we are to go in there running. You just can't hardly wait to get in there. But until then, I pray that the Lord will bless you uh, and keep you. I pray that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you. I pray that the Lord will be gracious to you and that he will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua. Go in peace, and may God bless you is my prayer.